Yep. So I wonder now that we are live, are we visible? Okay, we're missing a panelist. Are we? Mm, yes, John Strasky. No, where is he? Stutinsky, John Stutinsky, Vice Chairman, PIMCO, US. Oh, it must be midnight for him, maybe. Well, now it's, uh, yeah, 12 30 is in the US. Yeah, it's early. It's early for him. What we will do, we will start anyway. Okay, as soon as, which is now, considering our time restrictions. Correct. So I want to welcome everybody here at the Horaces Conference to this session. The session has a very interesting and funny name, COVID-19, the elephant in the room. And please allow me as the chair of um, this panel to, first of all, let you know my take on the issue. We have quite a bit to cover here. Questions such as, do we actually need to have strategic analysis and an approach to cope with uh, what is happening right now, the unknown? How do we actually best navigate through difficult and crisis times? And have our governments failed us, not over the last seven months only since the pandemic really hit? Or have they already failed us a long time ago? Before I get to the panelists, this is my um, two pennies worth of a view. First of all, I don't think that COVID-19 is an elephant in the room. I think that COVID-19 is actually a catalyst that puts the spotlight on many, many elephants in the room that have been happening and lingering for years, if not decades, and shows really where things are burning and going wrong. Till now, they've been lingering or completely ignored. Um, things like inequality, the climate, for example, uh, certain decadence of our society, the me, myself and I culture also being fed by social media and the dependency on the social media. And of course, um, certain erosion of a democratic system and the slight uh, growing influx of perhaps a little bit more dogmatic political, politi political leaders that we've seen. On the second point, I think that um, the reaction to the COVID-19 crisis from the governments we are all poking in the dark given that however you might send me a lot of hate mail I think the lockdown may or may not have been right but seven months into the pandemic we see one thing that the lockdowns have definitely succeeded in destructing a lot of our value created i.e our economy generating upheaval, generating poverty, people losing their jobs, their homes, which could generate a much bigger crisis potentially than what we're seeing right now in the long term and for the long term. However, of course, saving lives is a very important issue. However, what we've seen in terms of lockdowns has not uh, diminished the COVID-19 situation. Um, we are seeing the numbers going back up. So we have to perhaps learn for it. In terms of a decisive manager, how do we need to react to the unknown. I think that every day is an unknown. And if you are a manager, you're a facilitator, you're the one that scans the environment every single day. You scan, you strategize, you implement, 
you review and then you refine. And if you do that as a manager, a business leader, more or less on every single day, then you know that the unknown is always there and that you have to be ready in a positive sense and you're kind of ready for that. I call that approach the sir of business. On the third point, whether our governments have failed us or whether we feel suppressed, again, I sit here in Europe, especially in Switzerland. I call it La La Land for us. It's been a fairly easy lockdown. We've been able to go out. Um, things are going well. Why? Simply because here the government did not fail as many other countries are experiencing to invest tax money into the healthcare system. Because I remind everybody the reason why we had this lockdown as far as I understand, was simply because we cannot overload our um, healthcare system. And because our healthcare system was unprepared for a pandemic, which is supposed to be an unknown, yet has been trailed for many, many years by many, many experts, um, is something that I find personally really quite disgusting. So simply because our governments have failed us on the healthcare side, we had to have a lockdown because if we had not had that, perhaps the healthcare system would have been um, just overloading and um, creating more problems. And when it comes to um, really governments suppressing, not suppressing, look, I'm coming from Europe, I'm Hungarian, grew up in Germany and in the UK, and we just had the biggest corruption scandals coming out of Germany, be it the diesel scandal or wire card scandal. So you don't have to migrate out of Europe or into uh, lesser developed areas in this world in order to find a government or a society that may be corrupt. And with that, I wanted to open this uh, panel. And now let me introduce you all to our fantastic panelists. First of all, and I'm going uh, through them in alphabetic order. Tarun Anand, and here I need to take my glasses. Chairman and founder, Universal Business School, coming and joining us from India. Trailandra, if you want to kind of raise the hands, I'm easy to identify being the female here. Trailandra Goswami, Chairman and Managing Director, Pushkarai Group, also in India. Adam A. Jacobi, founder and chief steward of My Vote, coming from Australia. John Stutinsky, he's the vice chairman of PIMCO US. He's not here yet. Perhaps he will join us. And that's all to pass. Partner Gorijeta, Africa, Coton, Sa Vedra, the Philippines. And that's all. Sorry for messing up the pronunciation of your company. Tarun, let's, uh, let's start with you, first of all, and your opening statement. We all have about three to five minutes to really get your take on how you're see, seeing the situation right now. If you want to open your mic, that helps. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, an awesome opportunity granted to share our views on this wonderful platform. Um, so, you know, I, I uh, was thinking about this topic and I was uh, thinking about it from the context of uh, how do we, uh, whether it's a government or an individual uh, institution or a company, look at this entire crisis? And do we look at it from a context of how do we deal the next quarter or the next 25 years? Uh, how are we going to manage these trade-offs that have been put and some tough decisions like you mentioned? Uh, you know, Jonas Sachs uh, used to say, are you a good ancestor? Can we steal from our grandchildren uh, and, and actually hopefully get, uh, get through and make enough so that we return it back. Um, so that's the big question. So we are all in the same storm, but not in the same boat, right? Uh, this was put beautifully put by Mr. Manish Sabarwal, who is the CEO of Team Lease. Uh, we need to know if we are at the beginning, middle or end of the crisis. Now, that's one of the things which we still don't know how long this will continue. Of course, there are some green shoots of hope. But it's still we are in the ugly bit. Uh, we need to understand about demand. Will consumers and companies be frugal or will they go be, become hedonistic? Will they save for a rainy day or will they say, let's live for today? Uh, will risk aversion increase? Right. We obviously know we need to eat. But do we need to eat out? Uh, you know, that's the paradox of thrift. The more we save, the more we take away from the economy. 
but despite these expectations which are still you know uh, in in not clarified or clear uh, all policy can do uh, or governments can do in the short run is that the disease does not lead to death right working capital problems do not lead to bankruptcy right that's what companies are trying to do unemployment doesn't lead to hunger and to be frugal with capital so that you stay long enough to get lucky right there is a huge pressure on fiscal and monetary policy as central banks worldwide uh, have acted so swiftly with enormous scale enormous might uh, the chinese has given uh, remimbi 3 trillion injection into the banking system the bank of england has slash interest rates by 65 basis points and you know grown their balance sheet by 500 billion pounds the us fed is running a dis- fiscal deficit which is larger than the gdp of india this year right so this short term terminism as i would call it borrow billions of dollars bust the fisc may be the wrong sort of response in my view because specifically for developing nations like india right the problems are pre existing conditions yes some of them might have been amplified and accelerated due to due to the crisis uh, so we need to diagnose the problem the pain we are experiencing is a vital sign it's not the disease right we are making trade offs every day between borrowers and lenders between employees and employers between migrants and residents so so there is a unique context to the problems the issues for us in india is low productivity as we have been inadequately formalized as a nation in an economic sense we've been inadequately financialized we've been inadequately urbanized we've been inadequately industrialized and of course in inadequately skilled to some extent and that cannot change with a fiscal or monetary action so i think india is on one large country with a billion plus people which has two decades of growth ahead of it and i can talk more about this uh, you know the elephants in the room for me is lack of paucity of leadership across the world the geopolitics of this bipolar world that we are sitting in with two giants of the us and your uh, and china and some of the practical issues around sustainability of work from home is that even possible and i'll hand it over to my panelists to take it forward yep uh, thank you uh, patricia thank you Horace uh, for uh, giving us uh, this opportunity to be together discussing a subject of the day well uh, i had uh, learned about uh, uh, disaster management uh, when i was in college maybe 44 years ago but uh, we never uh, graduated in actual practice on how to take care of disaster management and today when we are talking of uh, a disaster management in a situation like this pandemic covid 19 you know i could consider every one of us on the same platform we all are equally confused because we have not really understood how to handle disasters because those were not the times earlier where we could have a disaster like this which i could say that that is the biggest unknown this pandemic uh, is something which uh, has been turned out to be the biggest unknown even today after 6 months down the line i did not find somebody confidently telling me as to this is what is the formula a plus b is going to be c so it is still a state of confusion for all of us so i sitting here and trying to point a finger at somebody there are three fingers pointing at myself because i do not understand it myself so how can i uh, point a finger at somebody so i consider every one of us in the same ship or boat whatever that you may call it and then we all have to put our minds together to understand this concept so it has taken almost 6 months to first of all understand the problem or the disaster that we are facing and then while doing so there had to be certain decisions which had to be taken because this is highly an unprecedented situation badly at affecting lives and livelihood so if we give priority to lives livelihood suffers and livelihood uh, if we give priority lives suffer so what should be taken uh, at the cost of the other 
was the big question which each and every government or each and every other country had it and i'm telling you this is not going to be easy i must have discussed this topic on several webinars in last 6 months but uh, not one place i could find some single line conclusion that we do this and this will happen so no one knows how far it will stretch no one knows somebody says that it could remain uh, uh, for two years somebody says it could remain forever it would be best to learn therefore to live with it or to coexist why really think of really getting rid of it when we don't know at this particular stage so the energies should be spent on understanding how to coexist with that now it is going to be very easy to learn to live with that and that is where we need to uh, understand uh, this particular pandemic and uh, if i take a comparison uh, with uh, the laptop keyboard we have two buttons on the laptop keyboard one is the pause button and the second one is the reset button so what pandemic has done is press the pause button and then it has simultaneously asked you to reset yourself when i say uh, pause meaning virtually the economies and all those things which tarun and patricia both you talked about how it went haywire uh, could be really looked at but i am going to spend more time on the reset reset is the change in your mindset change in your business uh, strategies change in your vision statements change in your lifestyles and things like that because you couldn't be running your businesses or you couldn't be having what you had it earlier 6 months before in the same manner that you would have it like for example today we are discussing this on a digital platform which otherwise in horasis we 300 people could have met in a gathering spend uh, maybe a couple of uh, uh, million rupees or uh, dollars and then had a lot of interaction physically for 3 4 days so uh, digitally everyone has become more matured digitally they have become more learned and things have changed the way we can experience this there are many other things which we will have to change or reset in our uh, uh, lifestyles businesses and values to cope up with the new normal this is a jargon which is getting thrown at us every now and then and nobody knows what is that new normal well uh, the new normal for me is to survive like uh, the mr uh, the, the chairman of alibaba uh, he said that my objective is to live this year mr ratan tata also said the same thing that i want to live this year next year if i live i will decide what i should be able to do it so the priorities have to be defined very very clearly if i live then i will be able to think about what i should be doing uh, in my life uh, uh, henceforth now we are always hopeful and we learn to adapt changes very quickly this is a simple human behavior and which is what has happened in last 6 months where we have adapted to this particular change so quickly that today we are finding it that we are very much up on the learning curve to take care of these vagaries of this particular pandemic and uh, we are hoping that a vaccine will be around the corner and uh, maybe beginning of 2021 we could be uh, getting that particular vaccine and getting our immunity back and things like that but having said all that a uh, livelihood uh, has really taken a toll Uh, the economy has taken its toll in the first quarter of our gdp uh, the, uh, the financial year we took a gdp beating of minus 23.9 from plus 4.1 six months ago we have come down to minus 23.9 another six to eight months time we hope to go back to that 4% plus and this will require a lot of effort coming from the industry as well as from government and government is quite proactive which we will discuss the steps the government has taken and i am very very hopeful that we will come out of it yeah shalanda thank you very much we all hopeful that we will have a v shaped recovery for sure thank you very much for that opening statement over to you adam how do you see it from down under if i may say from switzerland yeah th- thank you um i think i have a slightly different perspective than than what's come before um and it's probably worth saying before i say what i'm going to say that i i think a lot of these answers are contextual we're we're coming from different parts of the world that have endured this disease in different ways uh we have different qualities of governments responding in different ways and we come from different kind of economies and societies 
that place value in different kinds of ways. And, and so some of our answers will be, in fact, most of our answers, I suspect, will be uh, dictated by whatever that lived experience is. That said, I'm going to tell you what my perspective from my lived experience is. Um, I, I don't think this is so much an elephant in the room as I think it's a canary in the coal mine. Um, and I think it, from the Australian perspective, one of the things that's most interesting is that we've come off, you know, years and years of record economic growth. We've had some of our largest companies that have recorded multi-billion dollar quarterly returns quarter after quarter after quarter. And six months of shutdown and those companies are laying off tens of thousands of people and asking for government bailouts. And for me, the canary in the coal mine is that the existing hyper-capitalist system doesn't work. Because if you were that successful for that long time and you can't withstand a six-month downturn, then how successful were you really? And I think it, it really is a signal to us that the way that we have constructed our society is ultimately flawed um, and we need to use this opportunity of COVID as a way to reevaluate the way our system works and the way that we reconstruct our society so that we don't make the mistakes that happen pre-COVID again and we continue with something that is a little bit more sustainable and robust. The other thing that I would say is I think part of this challenge, um, and, and I think, Patricia, your first statements were really interesting, and um, I suspect these are the same things that are dividing every culture and every society going through the pandem pandemic at the moment, is this balancing act between lives and economies. And I think part of the challenge is that hyper-capitalism has left us, and again, I'm not advocating for communism or socialism, but hyper-capitalism as opposed to capitalism, which is what a lot of Western countries are going through. Um, hyper-capitalism basically says that we make our humanitarian policy off the back of our economic policy. We say we can give this much to foreign aid and we can pour this much into supporting people because that's what we can afford. And I would put to the group, both the audience and, and these wonderful panellists, that what we actually need going forward as a response to COVID is to invert that conversation and to say we need to start with a humanitarian policy that says this is what being human means, this is what our society requires to make sure that people are equal and comfortable and there isn't great economic disparity and there isn't racial inequality, et cetera, et cetera. And then we need to construct our economic systems around those principles. What we're currently doing is the other way around. So that's my two minutes worth. Um, that is absolutely um, excellent, Adam. Thank you very much for bringing that up. And I think the question about values is so important. And there I can only recommend a really good book. It's called Completing Capitalism by Bruno Roche, who is the chief uh, economist at Mars, Inc., the, the family-driven company. And he talks exactly about that, the economic model we are having right now. We've had over the last few decades based on value extraction rather than value generation for all stakeholders involved. And that is why he also has a subtitle, subtitle Heal Businesses to Heal the World. And I think this is exactly what he's coming to and saying, okay, we need to just construct long-term because these big giants, in a matter of six months, of course, they do not seem to have a sustainable business. So thanks very much for that. Okay, the last one to, uh, to come up with the opening statement. Uh, Tyrone, uh, Tyrone, can you just Put Sorry. yourself on mute so that we're not getting the feedback. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. Excellent, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, last but not least, hopefully, uh, I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about uh, an approach to the problem area that we have about dealing with unknown unknowns and elephants in the room. I, I would like to focus on the aspect of the problem question about what it takes to be an effective leader in the face of tremendous ambiguity, what we call unknown unknowns. Um, and I, I, I took this opportunity to go through a lot of case studies, as many case studies as I could uh, muster uh, from sectoral, sector by sector uh, cases to, to people and organizations, to countries. Of course, there's only so much I can talk about in the next uh, few minutes. But uh, I'd like to really focus on the basic question of, of what it takes for leadership to be effective in the face of uncertainty. And it seems that there is a claim that had arisen that basic management training has led leaders 
to backslide into taking delayed action and downplaying threats in the face of uncertainty. And because of that, the next question would be, in the face of ambiguous threats, how can business leaders uh, beat the negative impact of the pandemic in the face of stifling uh, government action or inaction? And a number of case studies have come about, and I'd like to extrapolate in, in some of these, and I'll skip through the details, but I have basically five points. And the first point is this. Uh, it seems that there are rosy areas that lead to the proposition that a focus on personal well-being over profits leads to profits. So I wouldn't say it's a trade-off. It's probably more of a balancing act and a focus on resources. Case in point would be Goldman Sachs, uh, focus on, on the well-being of their people on the trading floor, deploying really quickly and harnessing trading gains when when the market activity had spiked in the earlier and the middle parts of the global quarantine. Uh, the second point is that uh, is this. In the face of zero data, probably ambiguity, uh, action and not inaction will create empirically measurable impact. So if you need data, then the bias there is to act, which would then make you an agent of producing the data which you need. A case there is the National Basketball Association led by Adam Silver. Uh, the third point, and I, I just have a couple more points so I could uh, wind up. The third point is, is, is this. Uh, correcting information asymmetry can curb infection asymmetry. And I guess a sub point there would be the ex to explore the link between fake news and, and real infections. Uh, lots of data about that. Uh, the fourth point would be uh, to recognize that the pandemic and the lockdowns it has caused has led to a hyper sedative, sorry, a hyper, a collective hypersensitivity to digital engagement. So hypersensitive uh, human act reaction to digital engagement. Uh, that cuts both ways. And there are lots of cases about that. Um, and the fifth and last point basically is to really harp on not just merging science and leadership principles in engaging the pandemic, rather to, to merge uh, science, leadership, and meaningful communication principles in the face of the pandemic. And lots of cases about this probably we can turn to New Zealand and maybe even um, you know NGO activity such as Channels Challenge Seattle by, by Chris Gregoire, a number of cases about that, not just talking about leadership principles, not just science, but also communicative, communication, uh, effective communication tools and principles. Thank you, Patricia. That, that Thank you very much. Let me quickly back circle with a question to what you were saying and, um, you know, managing the uncertainty and being prepared, getting data and also intelligence in order to, to have everything and, and alert early enough. How do you balance that if you have at the same time, let's say as a listed company, the pressure of producing profits on a continuous basis, whereas uh, making sure that a potential crisis that may or may not happen is well looked after and even financed or there needs to be a restructuring done on an ongoing basis, which is um, potentially eroding profits, which might not be too popular with shareholders, for example. Yeah, uh, good question. A very, very difficult question. I'd like to turn to the case of uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, via V, the response of maybe even Bank of America and uh, um, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. So uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, early part of the pandemic, March and April, um, Goldman Sachs was able to uh, recognize and act decisively in making sure to spread out their trading floor and, and utilize remote work arrangements. So it was a firm sponsored approach where equipment, communication material, digital media, uh, to, to television sets, you know, uh, screens rather, uh, were deployed and quickly procured and spread out so as to bolster work from home uh, arrangements. Um, so would you because, mind just repeating your uh, last sentence? You just froze for a minute. Sorry. Sorry. I think it's uh, my fault. But uh, uh, the, uh, long story short, is Goldman Sachs, I think, to me, is, is a good case where 
uh, work from home and remote working arrangements were quickly harnessed. And when the trading floor or trading activity uh, uh, reacted so much so that trading gains could be captured in March and April, Goldman Sachs was able to react more quickly and, and capture gains as opposed to uh, a case where Bank of America, uh, where, where a lot of well, delayed actions was like some sort of indecisiveness on in what to do on, on trying to disperse the, the, the trading floor and, and such that there was even a pressure for workers to come back to the actual physical trading floor. Uh, uh, so the decisiveness of, of, of Goldman Sachs there proved to be a, a, a good uh, mm -hmm. balance between um, workers' health and, and profit objectives. Thank you. Can I, can, can I just put to you that? Can, yeah. I, just, now that it's actually um, 15 minutes to, to the panel and also to all the audience. Yeah, I, I just want to touch on that a little bit because that to me, whilst I don't necessarily dis disagree with the analysis, um, I, I think it is a there it is a particular lens that you're looking through. Um, and it's kind of like when I hear, and I'm not comparing you, so don't take this the wrong way, but it's kind of like when Donald Trump says um, the economy is booming, but what he means is that the share market's booming. And what he then fails to say is, but only a tiny fraction of the community is in the stock market. It, it, it fails to understand that there is this massive majority of people that are getting left behind because your the way that you manage and categorise value and success is predicated on a particular small group at the top. And as long as you look at the top as being the lens of success and comfort and prosperity, um, then we will continue to have greater divide. What happens to the, you know, the millions of SMEs, the small to medium enterprises, the small companies with three people, four people, five people in them that cannot function, you know, and, and so, so, and in our, go in our government, in Australia, um, we have a, a hyper conservative, um, um, you know, business oriented government and all of the value goes back to the big end of town with bailouts and, you know, a, a huge number of people who are out of the SME community or have um, part-time jobs just get further left behind. Um, and, I, and to your point earlier, Patricia, I think, you know, the long-term tail effect of this is not just going to be catastrophic from an economic perspective. I think it's going to be catastrophic from a social perspective because it, those people that were already behind will be even further behind. Yeah, I would like to add up uh, and corroborate uh, with the point uh, that has been highlighted because I come from manufacturing, uh, spent 43 years uh, looking at uh, running uh, corporations, enterprises uh, and uh, managing operations. What, his, uh, what the point which has been brought about on the MSMEs, the micro, small, medium scale enterprises is very, very valid. You know, the bigger corporations can survive whatever those... Uh, um, uh, variables are there in the industry, negative, positive. But it, when it comes to the MSMEs, which in India, at least in the manufacturing sector, constitute almost 55% of the total manufacturing capacity that one has it, and which could be a three um, uh, or four people to maybe maximum 100 people. It could be mom and shop, uh, mom and pop uh, type of uh, shops. These are the people... Uh, the, the statistics says that more than 50 or 60 percent of these MSMEs are going to wind up because of the uh, total uh, gap, the communication gap between the facilities which are being provided by the government and what they are supposed to have it with themselves. Now, in spite of government announcing those uh, financial packages, by the time it reaches, for all you know, that MSME MSME could have disappeared because survival of the day is becoming very, very important. Six months is not a short period for somebody to just close down. I can give you several such examples. For example, I've seen several uh, b b businesses in hospitality industry, whether it is uh, uh, restaurants, whether it is airlines, whether it is uh, tourism, uh, you know, they have just vanished. I don't know how they are going to come out. Uh, uh, every, it is very easy to say, how do we restore but then where is the question of restoring when you do not exist? And that is the biggest problem, which is getting uh, uh, really on the table, which not many people would be finding it easy to address. And we must uh, 
come to terms with this kind of a scenario that we have it is that the economy is not built by the only large corporations it is built by all those msmes who are really pushing the larger corporations uh, about the table Yeah that's a very good point and for example here in uh, in Europe if you look at Italy it's about 90% of not only small and medium sized businesses but family owned businesses and i guess they are really struggling with what is the blood of any 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 business which is the cash flow and the cash flow management how how can you as a small or family business have enough cash to carry you through to you know through a crisis like this one for 6 months never mind 12 or 18 months in order to come out with or without the help direct help of the government um on the other side is the depression market a lot of businesses in specific sectors of course are starting to go bust let me circle it back to you tarun what are you really thinking about the common so you know this is uh, what what a lot of people are talking about this k shape right the the big corporations are earning billions and hundreds of billions and then you have this massive big chunk which is really going down the tube and i would say there's a you know it's a it's a, a symptomatic of uh, i would call it a paucity of leadership across the world i mean i i i don't like to talk politics on such a platform but it was amusing to 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 see future presidents you know doing what they were doing on on the world stage right a leader is a dealer of hope in my view right and so the leaders have to aim high and look far uh you know the gap in from an indian perspective uh is that you know the aspiration uh, the difference between in india's aspiration and real reality is not a lie it's a disappointment right so what what tends to happen whether it's a corporation or a or a leader of a political uh, institution and i'm talking this across the globe uh, you know we end up in this uh, pushing the world into uh, this donkey horse complex where the donkeys are celebrating uh, and the horses are getting frustrated because they are putting so much effort but not getting out of there so i think this needs to be uh resolved through some really uh, targeted action uh and and targeted uh, you know in the sense that uh, it reaches the right person at the right time uh, with the impact otherwise it's too late adam um yeah i i have again i have a slightly different perspective to this um for me i think the broader issue is that um we are look and you know i'll i'll use tom's example of, of the right this way actually Tyrone can you just put yourself on mute because I'm getting some feedback thank you um I I think the you know the debate that happened a couple of days ago is indicative really it's symbolic for me of what many of us have known for a very long time um which is that democracy and politics are actually mutually exclusive they can, they can't coexist they're completely different philosophically and they're completely different in practice so democracy is about enacting the will of the people and politics is about control based on ideology those two things are oil and water they can't coexist so what you have is a group of people who are pushing a particular line and a particular ideology about the way they see the world and what we need is leadership that is steeped in actual democracy pet leaders who say i am here as a vessel for the community to tell me what we need to do and my job is to inform you and provide you the information to make better decisions what we have now are people who ask for your vote but never listen to your voice and that's not democracy you know and part of the reason that we're failing as societies all over the world you know whether it's you know west rich western countries or or poor and developing nations is because the leaders are all um uh, entrenched in these ideas where they believe, and i know this because i speak to presidents and prime ministers on a regular basis that they have this savior complex that they think they need to come in and ride in and save all of us to which the response is always from our end and our organization we don't fucking need you to do that what we need you to do is listen that that's actually your job in a democracy is to listen to us um but but to me that's the underlying problem here that leadership has to start with listening and it has to start with a dialogue to everybody and in my opinion a great leader's first uh, from an elected perspective uh, elected representative perspective a great leader's first responsibility is informing their citizens so that that community can make better decisions and so do you want to come in yeah i i'd like to take off on on the need for decisive leadership uh, especially um and a case in point here would be probably arguably 
um, the initiatives of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, and after mixed signals, a lot of mixed signals and inaction on the part of the federal government, um, he stood out. And what he did was he spoke plainly, he spoke frequently, he spoke honestly, and very candidly admitting the failures of you know Congress and, and the federal regulators. And that in itself, uh, his clear and honest approach, updates about COVID-19, scientifically backed recommendations, I mean, his harping on the fact that science would rule the day, uh, provided an anchor and, and made him stand out as a arguably a good example in a time of uh, uncertainty. Yeah. Um, I would like to make a comment to what you just said, Adam, about, you know, the mutual exclusivity as a, as a leader, especially a political leader. And, um, I, it made me think about if you're in politics, you should actually not be political. Because if you, if you compare a politician and a big uh, conglomerate, the politician works for the next election, the next four years, and then getting back into office. And that is it. Every single world counts. As a corporation is trying to get the numbers in so the shareholders happy are happy from quarter to quarter. And that is very, very difficult. But look, for example, uh, one, uh, one German leader, past German leader, who took very decisive, fast, and hugely unpopular action got voted out the next time, which perhaps for the German economy was wrong. And that was Gerhard Schröder when he set up the Agenda uh, uh, 2010. It is a long time ago, but if you think about the last 10 years and economically where Germany has been heading because of his reforms, which was hugely painful to all those people in the economy that wanted to be listened to, to not lose their job for the you know country as a whole, it was the right thing to do. And Europe profits from the strength of Germany till today. Um, so th this is where the hard balancing act is. If you are dependent on somebody voting for you, of course, you have to try to address as many people as possible. And if we look at the outcome of the, of the American election in 2016, I mean, nobody, that's a big unknown that came about. I, nobody I, voted for Trump I, by 3 million votes. There's the I, I, system I, I, wrong, not necessarily the people that had a voice. I don't disagree with that. And there's no question that people who are elected to high office have an exceptionally complex and challenging job in front of them. Um, however, I, I would put to you that if, if, if the information that is provided to you as a leader indicates clearly to you that tough decisions are required for the greater good, that it is your responsibility to share that information with your constituents and make your case and if you can't make the case that it's in the best interest and the people want to go in a different way, well, that's democracy. That's the whole point, that it's that if the people understand what's in front of them and have access to that information and choose to do something different, that is what democracy is about. Um, it's painful at times and it's hard to do, but ultimately we either embrace democracy or we embrace politics, but we can't do both. Okay. Shalandra? Yep. I would like to... Uh go to the basic fundamentals of leadership as such. There are two words which are just getting coined, that leadership and political leaderships. You know, by getting a, a politics into the right place in a democratic uh, uh, system, you get elected to rule that particular country. And the leader of that particular political party becomes the political leader. But then he simultaneously also becomes the leader of the country. Now, there is a difference between a political leader and the leader of the country. So a political leader may be propagating the mandate uh, policies of that particular political party while he is floating around within the party. But when he becomes the leader of the country as such, he will have to take the policies of the entire country, whether that could encompass the policies of uh, the opposition, the common man or things like that. And this is the distinction which a leader going to the top in any country has to understand, which is what we are experiencing in our country in the last six or seven years, that a common man has gone 
and uh, taken the leadership and then he's understood the problems of the common man and the policies which are getting framed they reach directly to the poor of the country they really, uh, reach to the farmers of the country and so on and so forth so this distinction once the political leader takes a leadership position he has to uh, give away all his political ambitions uh, uh, for the not ambitions the political stands and then take a country stand rather than a political stand that's a good point we have exactly 2 minutes and 18 seconds gentlemen i would like to do a quick wrap up of this uh, fantastic discussion which could go on for a, long, a lot longer than we have time for i would li- like to ask each one of you your key learnings how yourself your company corporation your governments have been dealing with the last few months and what do you think the fundamental change will be long term going forward uh, from this pandemic can i start yes sure okay oh great so you know i think uh, as i mentioned uh, i think we are in a sweet spot uh, there's a glut of financial capital going around the world uh, we have a global window which is opening up in that sense uh, you know as we call it the chinese uh, refugee manufacturing companies who want to potentially leave to have dual supply chains i think from a structural perspective uh, you know there has been a shift in the world of work from you know lifelong contracts to uberization and in in my case the world of education you know 30 years of learning 30 years of earning 30 years of retirement that train has left the station right so uh, from a policy perspective i think india uh, you know it's it's about not solving the sum but, but painting a picture and change can only happen in our view when the problem the solution and the timing comes together and i think india is on such a path yeah uh, the learnings on personal front that i have become uh, more uh, time conscious in an hour i try to cover i reach globally everywhere i have become digitally more mature uh, i could have uh, i couldn't have used uh, laptops uh, so much uh, as i have been using now and on professional front uh, like uh, challenges there are several opportunities which have opened up Six months have been terribly busy time as far as I am concerned. Like we say it, a door closes, ten doors open, and I am a firm optimist, and I am in catching on all those opportunities which are opening up, which otherwise I would not have looked at. Okay, we have a few seconds left, Adam and Edsel, please. Okay, mine basically is the old Chinese adage that crisis breeds opportunity. That's it. Edsel. Yeah, I just want to recognize that uh, you know that. Um, economic shocks uh brought by the lockdown can be as damaging as as ineffective leadership and as something we Thank you so much. Thank you all to all of you for this very interesting discussion. And yes, I'm there with Shalanda. I'm an optimist too, uh, but I also know about positivity that you you mentioned, uh, Tarun. We have it all in us. And if things are just humming along, why always look at the bad, get away with things? And sometimes our memories are a little bit shorter than uh, they should be. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye-bye. you. Thanks. Well done Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you thank didn't you. look like the first time, right? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, how to. It's the first time I did a host a panel on like I do my uh, mentor TV show of course uh, via Zoom over the past few months, but hey, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. And stay safe all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.